um, to start off with, let's just look at Isaiah 53 and uh, verse 6 in particular. <clears throat> it says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. In, in my mind, that's very graphic. Um, I can see the sheep out on the, out on the hills. Uh, I can see the shepherd trying to keep them all together. I can see sheep, uh, especially when they get scared or when they are looking for food or water or something, starting to scatter and how difficult it is uh, to keep them in check. Some of them will wander off into dangerous paths. Uh, others will get entangled in bushes. Others can find themselves out in the main road and get killed. Uh, others can be stolen. They're, they're in all sorts of danger when they've left the shepherd and his supervision. That's a simple way of telling us that we become unrighteous when we go astray, when we want our own way, when we're not willing to submit to God's rule in our lives. Let's look uh, now, uh, if you will, to Romans chapter 1, 28 through 29. This explains the, the downturn for humanity and how we got into the position of not one being righteous, no, not one. It says in verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. We think it's a small matter to go our own way. We think it's a, a small thing to turn our back on God and on God's righteousness. But the truth of the matter is, as we look at our society slipping into further decline, going from bad to worse, we've got to understand that it's because of this unrighteousness that we are going backwards instead of forwards, that we're cursed instead of being blessed, that life becomes so difficult for all of us, that interpersonal relationships are breaking down, families are disintegrating, there's sickness and death abounding on every hand. Unrighteousness is just simply a transgression of divine law. That's what it is. By being unrighteous, we rob God and others of their rights. We are selfish, or become selfish if we weren't selfish in the first place, and we are selfishly ambitioned, ambitious. I mean, that is the focus of our life. Our own ambitions, our own desires for ourselves, our, our, own, our own upbuilding and glorifying. In our pursuit of self-fulfillment, we cause injustices to proliferate and generally make life miserable for everyone. We just take advantage. 
We're in competition with everybody else, and everybody else is in competition with me. I will survive. I will get what I want. I will do what I want. This is my life. And I'm grabbing hold of it with both my hands. God help anybody who gets in my way. An unrighteous life will prevent us, or will prevent you and me, from entering heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10 spells it out so clearly here. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Listen to that. Let it sink in. Let it make a, an etching on your mind. Tattoo it on your brain. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care what charities they support. I don't care that they're good neighbors or good parents. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't be deceived. The delusion is everything's all right with these people out there. It's not. As God sees them, they are unrighteous. And as unrighteous people, they are in rebellion towards God. They are selfishly ambitious. They are hurting and causing mayhem in this world. It's sort of like the white collar crime and the blue collar crime. <clears throat> the young fellow goes in with a knife and tries to rob a, a bank or, or, or a store, a grocery store or something. And we think, oh how horrible, throw him into prison. He deserves to be punished. Fellow all dressed up like myself. <laughs> and uh, who's in a position where he's running a mul multinational company making billions of pounds can be skiving off the money for himself can be putting in false claims can be doing all sorts of wicked things all sorts of wicked things and we think oh God help him no I should give him a break no don't put him in prison Give him a rap over the knuckles. Tell him he's wrong, but don't put him in prison. Why, what, what's this prejudice we've got? There's no partiality with God. That white-collared fella is just as unrighteous as that young fella that went in with the knife to rob the grocery store. It's the same deal and the same condemnation for both of them. Did I read 9 and 10? I don't think I did. <laughs> I didn't. I got to read 9 and 10 now. <laughs> I got carried away, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, uh, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. That's what the Holy Spirit says. That's what God says. And what God says is the truth. This is the futility of unrighteousness. It is destroying our souls. It is destroying our world. It is destroying our souls. And it will prevent us from entering into the kingdom of heaven. Whether it's your father or mother, sister or brother, son or daughter, aunt or uncle, no matter who it is, it'll prevent them from getting into the kingdom of heaven. And your partiality won't make one bit of difference 
on the day of judgment because God will show no partiality to anyone. And that's what we would expect of a righteous God. Okay then, right, we admit what the difficulties are here. We admit that we've been part, party to and part of this uh, movement of unrighteousness in, re uh, in rebellion towards God and in being selfish and self-indulgent. We were all part of it. How can a man be right with God? Well, when you view it from that standpoint, it's very difficult. In Job 9 verse 2 it says, But can a man be right with God? You just ask the question. Well, if he's in his sins, can he be right with God? And the answer to that is no. If he had no sin, could he be right with God? Yes. But all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So where does that leave all in that context? In another place in Job it says, Can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Job 4.17 In another place it says, How then can a man be just with God? Or how can he be clean who is born of woman? These questions were asked by a few men in the book of Job. What is impossible, of course, for man? And as we see the situation, it's just impossible. There's no way that we can cleanse ourselves from our sins. There's no way that we can justify what we've done. There's no way that we can be right when we've been wrong. It just doesn't work. So we can't see any way out of this dilemma before God Almighty. Thank God what we find impossible is possible for him. And the New Testament tells us that God can and will justify the believing sinner. That's a, that's a combination that you don't often hear, a believing sinner. But that was exactly what we were before we were justified. God's justification of believing sinners has two aspects to it. The forgiveness of sins and being counted righteous. I'll give you the definition of the word justification by a man called Louis Berkhoff. To declare judicially that one state is in harmony with the demands of the law. Now that's interesting, isn't it? How can I, who've broken the law all my life, be judged to be in harmony with the law of God. I can't. But God has found a way. That's from Berkhoff's Systematic Theology, page 510. W.E. Vine says, The legal and formal acquittal from guilt by God as judge, the act of pronouncing righteous. That's in W.E. Vine's book, page 284. As you can see, the word justification has to do with God, the judge of all the earth, legally and formally acquitting us from the guilt and of our sins and pronouncing us righteous, judiciously declaring one state is in harmony with the demand of his holy law. God has found a way to do this without being inconsistent with himself. He still is, the, is just and he is the justifier of those who have faith in God. Because a person cannot be right before God in his sins and God cannot pronounce a guilty person guiltless, and this is an important point, God cannot say to the wicked, you are righteous. And God will not say to the righteous, you are wicked. If the judge of all the earth is to judge properly, and a man comes before him who is guilty of all the crimes that he's been accused of, 
the judge has to pronounce him guilty and has to also give him the sentence that is required by the law, whatever that sentence might be. And God is, God is exactly the same. In Proverbs chapter 17, In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15, the book of Proverbs says, He who justifies the wicked, in other words, says he's not guilty and says that he's righteous, and he who condemns the righteous, saying that the righteous is guilty and he's blameworthy, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. We better be careful about our, the judgments we make on other people. Judge a righteous judgment, we're told. If the person is wicked, then the person is wicked and is guilty. If the person is righteous, then acknowledge their righteousness. In Deuteronomy 25, 1 and 2, it says... Sorry, yeah, Deuteronomy 25, 1 and 2. If there is a dispute between men and they go to court and the judge decides their case and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall then make him lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of stripes according to his guilt. So this is the way of the courts. This is the way of justice. God is a just God. God must pronounce the wicked to be guilty and punishable. This is why, this is why God has to acquit us of guilt and then count us righteous. But it's only after we've been forgiven of our sins that a person is guiltless and clean before God. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, 5 through 8. It says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessedness or the blessing on the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So in order for us to be counted righteous, we have got to be first forgiven of our sins. When all sins are removed from your life and you are left clean, then God can say that in that condition, I can count you righteous. Because you are righteous. You're not wicked. You've been forgiven of all the sins, the wickedness that you've committed, the unrighteousness that you've done in your life, the wrongs, all gone. None of it left. You are there sinless, guiltless, and God pronounces you righteous in his eyes. In other words, you've now got a right standing before God. And it's, and it's a standing that could have been given had you kept the law perfectly. But is now given gratuitously to you because your sins have been forgiven. 
Can we see what's happening here? It's important for us to realize when God forgives our sins. When does an alien sinner receive the forgiveness of sins? Well, first he's got to hear the gospel. You're in Romans, stay there, look at Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Notice he says, the righteous man shall live by faith. Not the wicked man shall live by faith, the righteous man. This righteous man is a, one who's been, is a person who's been forgiven of his sins and has been counted righteous by God. This man can be acceptable to God as he has faith in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But first, he has to hear the gospel. The gospel reveals this righteousness about God. And incidentally, this righteousness is simply God's love and mercy and forgiveness and justification in Christ. So when he counts his righteousness to you, He's not counting the righteous deeds of our Lord Jesus Christ as some claim. He's counting his mercy, his forgiveness, his justification to you. He's counting that to you. And in him allowing you to be considered in this light as righteous before him, he can save you. He will save you. He will glorify you with him in his heavenly kingdom. That's what's waiting for us. But it's for the righteous. We're talking about when we've received the forgiveness of sins. Mark 16 says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves shall be condemned. So, there's a, a belief in this gospel. We've got to believe the good news. We've got to believe that the righteousness of God, his mercy, forgiveness, and his justification are working together for us to give us a standing before him to save our souls. Acts 2.38 says that the sinner must repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Put it in logical order. We need to believe, we need to repent, and we need to be baptized, is what he's saying, straight off. It is when we die to sin that we are justified from sin. That's in Romans chapter 6, verse 7. So he's still in Romans. Let's go to chapter 6, verse 7, and just see that statement there. It's a small statement in a very large argument. He says, he who has died is freed from sin. The word freed there is justified from sin. The dying that he speaks about here happens when we identify with the crucified Saviour in the likeness of his death, burial and resurrection in baptism. Now I know there's lots of people out there who would dispute that with me. But that's the context of Romans chapter 6. The identification in the likeness of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ in baptism is the time when we die to sin. And he who has died to sin is justified from sin. So it's in that death that the justification will come. When we die to sin and are raised to walk in the newness of life, the believer is forgiven of his sins and counted righteous by God. 
I don't know if I need to read from 3 through 7. Uh, maybe I do, just to get the context here. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus have been baptised into his death? Therefore we, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, see, this is where the death is taking place, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. We're not only forgiven of our sins, but we are no longer slaves to sin or enslaved to sin. Paul reminds the Christians in 1 Corinthians that they had been alien sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we've looked at that already. We go back there to see what the solution to the difficulty was or is verses 9 and 10 talked about the thieves, the covetous, the drunkards the revilers, the swindlers not inheriting the kingdom of God and then in verse 11 he says such were some of you but you were washed In other words, you were, when were you washed? You were washed when you were baptised. But you were sanctified. When were you sanctified? Well, you were set apart. Your old, old self has been done away with. You get a new life. And this new life is separated from sin and dedicated to God. That's the sanctification in baptism. Set apart from the world for God. You were justified by God. Acquitted of sins and counted righteous by God. That's what this justification was. You were acquitted of your sins and counted righteous by God. And that was in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God according to verse 11. So, we need to acknowledge that we were slaves of sins. But we're no longer slaves of sins. But it was, we also need to be reminded all the time that you are slaves of the one whom you obey. Either of sin resulting in death or of righteousness resulting or of obedience, sorry, resulting in righteousness. So what do you want to be? Do you want to be the sinner or do you want to be in the righteous camp? In the sinner's camp or the righteous camp? I want to be in the righteous camp. But I can only be there if God counts me righteous. And I can only be counted righteous when God forgives me of my sin and cleanses me from all my unrighteousness. Are we getting the picture here? And this is important because the, these, this theological subject, I'm not giving it to you in the theological way, I'm giving it to you in the scriptural way. But if you can grasp this, then there's, there are things that are being taught out there that you will be able to deal with and won't cause you as much problem as it caused me when I first became a Christian. We're saved by God's mercy. It's, it's very difficult to have to say that to brethren. We should know we're saved by God's mercy. In Titus chapter 2, 5 through 7. Titus chapter 2, 5 through 7. Sorry, chapter 3, 5 through 7. 
He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And when he says he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, that would suggest that for the Jew, he would have to think, God didn't save me because I did, kept the righteous law, the law of Moses, and I've kept it as faithfully as I could. I couldn't be saved on that basis. And the Gentile would have to accept that even if he tried to be living a moral life and his deeds were generous and kind and good to his fellow man, those righteous deeds are not going to save him because they're not perfectly righteous. There's, there's only intermittent righteousness in our life and the rest of it is wickedness. No one can be saved by such deeds done in righteousness. Each one is saved by God's mercy, forgiveness and justification in Christ. That is the righteousness of God to us when we are justified by his grace. So, this washing of regeneration is part of God's grace. It is God's way of justifying us by his grace. This washing of uh, regeneration is the bath of new birth, the laver of new birth. The laver was a huge bath in the Old Testament tabernacle, or outside the Old Testament tabernacle, where the priests would wash their bodies initially to consecrate themselves to God and then their hands and their feet and that as they went in on a daily basis to serve God. So here's this bath of new generation spoken about in the New Testament and it has to be, the only thing that's equivalent to it is baptism. It is baptism. I don't know of a commentator that I've read who, haven't, who hasn't acknowledged, probably against our will, but hasn't acknowledged that this is baptism. So what he's saying then is that according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration or baptism and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, the making a new life in us by the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out richly upon us, is the way that God had or has decided he would use to justify us by his grace and make us heirs according to the hope of eternal life. When, when we see this in its proper context, we're not earning salvation by being baptized. That's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. We are simply relying in faith on the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ which we are proclaiming by identifying with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means by which God will forgive me of my sins and count me righteous and justify me and that's what God is telling us we must do this is not a meritorious act a work of the law this is an act of faith in Jesus Christ our Lord and in God's mercy, forgiveness and justification in Christ. The Apostle Paul was overwhelmed with when, he, when he realized God's mercy in Christ. Overwhelmed by it. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12-17. I'm saying he was overwhelmed and I also think we, sh we should be overwhelmed by it as well. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12. 
I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the way of the only God, the invisible God. This is what brings glory and honour to God, that we will be saved in this manner. In Galatians 2, 15 and 16, it says, we, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not, is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Now that's, that's what we need to understand. It was easy for him, coming from the background of works in, under the Old Testament law, it should be easy for us. Most of us came from Catholicism. We were also under a work system, salvation by works. Not the works of the scriptures, not works of faith, but the works that the Catholic Church determined by its own magisterium, their traditions, their sacramental system, all of it working together to bring you salvation. Those works were absolutely useless in the sight of God. They mean nothing to God. The works that we must have are works of faith in Christ Jesus our Lord and that, uh, and that we must put that trust in God and submit to God's will on every matter in order that we might be counted righteous. The danger for us, brethren, is we started out like Paul, believing in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith and not by works of the law, but we can end up seeking to be justified by our works of obedience. It's so easy for that to happen. Especially when every week you're told to obey Christ, you're told to do what's right, you're told to, uh, this is what God requires of you and all the rest of it. We begin to think again of my own importance as it relates to the works that I'm doing, to the righteousness that I'm performing. But if we get, we, we, if we start to get that wrong, we're in real trouble. We're in real trouble. We are not saved by our own works. We are saved by the grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's an emphatic statement. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Having said that, saints must live righteously before God. Now that we are counted righteous and have a right standing before God, we are obliged to live righteously before him all the days of our lives. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong and the one who is filthy still be filthy and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and the one who is holy still keep himself holy take note of the phrase let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness let the one who is righteous by God's mercy forgiveness and justification 
still practice the righteousness of the law of faith. That's what we need to do. Because it will be inconsistent to do anything else. If we elected a Lord Mayor, we would, after his inauguration, expect him to act like a Lord Mayor, because anything less is unacceptable. If God has chosen us and elected us, so to speak, to be righteous, then anything less than righteous behaviour is unacceptable for who we have become in Christ Jesus. No one who abides in him, that is, remains or lives in him, sins. In other words, practices, remains or lives in sin. No one who sins, lives in sin, has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 6 and 7. You took the... the, the, the um, the doctrine was being altered. The, the, the people were uh, teaching false teachings and telling the brethren that you can commit sin, you can be yourself, you, and God will accept you. It's very much like what's happening today. And John tells them, now John is the loving apostle. He tells them, look lads, this is inconsistent with your calling. It's inconsistent with your Christianity. You cannot live this way. You are not righteous unless you are practicing righteousness. Now that means living uh, morally and keeping God's commandments. The moral aspect of uh, righteousness in Christianity is very high because it, involved, it involves what is going on in the heart in conjunction with the deeds. An example of that is Matthew chapter 5, 27 and 28. He says there in Matthew, 25, uh, Matthew 5, 27 and 28, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. God doesn't just look at the deed, he's looking at the motivation, he's looking at the thoughts which spurred that deed. Both of those things are important to God and as far as the righteousness of the New Testament is concerned, both of them must be taken into account and will be taken into account. So we've got a much harder task than the people under the law. Under the law, if you didn't commit actual adultery, then you seem to be fine. You are, you are righteous according to the law. But under the gospel of Jesus, if you had not committed it, but wanted to, and went out lusting to, then you are also guilty. There's and a list in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. We'll just read a few of the things. Can't read it all it's, uh, too lengthy. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, these are moral requirements and the keeping of God's commandments. Ephesians chapter 4, 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have, have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. 
therefore laying aside falsehood speak truth with, with, uh, with your neighbour 26 be angry and yet do not sin let not the sun go down on your wrath and do not give the devil an opportunity 28 he who steals must steal no longer but rather must labour performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Those are the standards, brethren. Those are the, this is the lifestyle that is supposed to be our lifestyle. This is the righteousness that demonstrates to all the world that we belong to God. That we consider ourselves righteous because we've been counted righteous by God. That we are cooperating with God by being righteous and keeping God's commandments. We love God and demonstrate that love by keeping his commandments. Matthew, or, um, it's Gospel of John chapter 14, verses 15. Uh, and 21 and 24 I think it is so <clears throat> what are we saying here well I'm going to let Philippians Paul in Philippians chapter 2 12 and 13 show us that no matter what God expects of us we're going to need his help to carry it out we're not can't do it perfectly but just, that's the way it is. That's the human condition. We can't do it perfectly. But uh, in, in the book of Philippians, he shows us that what is happening in our lives is that we are trying to do God's will, and, but we're not trying to do it alone. We're allowing God to work in us, to will and to work for his good, good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2 beginning with verse 12. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Keeping the commandments should not make us feel self-righteous. We can't be like the Pharisee who goes up to the, to the temple and looks around him and, and sees... Uh, the tax gatherer there and, and uh, he, he's praying to himself thank God I'm not like other men <clears throat> he didn't go down to his house justified that sort of uh, uh, superiority that sort of pride that arrogance that he displayed here was contrary to everything that God wants from us he needs us to humbly obey his will and we, we've got to understand that we are slaves of God. Anything that we're doing is only what we should be doing. It's what we ought to have done in the first place. This is what God required from the whole human race from the very beginning. We've never lived up to it. But now when we try to start living up to it, we become proud. We start to feel superior to everybody else. We can't do that. That's absolutely wrong. Yes, there is a blessing in keeping the commandments. There is natural built-in things to keeping the commandments. I don't know how much God has saved me from because I've tried to do what is right in, this, in, in every situation. If I'd have done the wrong, think of the amount of problems that would have come into my life which I've been saved by, from by doing what is right. Look, the last day is coming. The God will judge us in righteousness by Jesus Christ our Lord. And when he says, Come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's calling the righteous. He's calling the righteous there. Righteous because they'd be counted right through forgiveness of sins and justification in Christ Jesus. Righteous because they have tried to their, to their best and the influence of God and asking continually for forgiveness uh, to do righteousness in their lives towards others and towards God.
this is the way God justifies us. And in this way, we will all be saved for all eternity through the grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the story. That's the message for today. I, I know it's a little bit complex, but I hope it's been clear enough for you to grasp and understand. This is very important stuff. I'll leave it with you.